Well, good morning, Bedrock Church. Hopefully you guys are warm and safe at home this morning, um, enjoying the snow or the snow that is to come today. We wanted to be able to still put our message together this morning so that we didn't get behind in our sermon series of Titus. And so um, we decided we were going to go ahead and put this video together for this morning. And so hopefully you're able to watch that together. Um, and so just a couple of announcements uh, as we begin today. Just reminders really of a few things. Um, first and foremost, um, don't forget we are doing our Read Through the Bible in a Year plan. Um, you can find information about that on our website or on our church app. We are on the Church Center app. And so if you download the Church Center app, uh, you can find... Uh, our <clears throat> our app and uh, with all kinds of helpful links that are easy to navigate from a smartphone. Um, also, don't forget that on the 29th, we have our family orientation, and that's really our membership class. Uh, there's no commitment at this class. It's really just for information so you know what it means to be a member, a part of Bedrock Church in Franklin County. Um, also, um, we have a new text group going out, um, a group that is going to just be lifting up prayer requests as they come in. And so you can join that um, at any point. Uh, you should see the, the number up on your screen right now that you can text the word prayer to if you want to join in and be a part of that group. Okay, well, We're really excited to worship together this morning. Uh, before we get to that, I would love to just open our time together in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for your beauty. God, we thank you for the beauty of your creation and the snow that we are anticipating. Um, Lord, I pray for those that would be traveling uh, over the next few days, Lord, that you would just give them safety in that, Lord. Uh, I also pray for our time together this morning that as we dive into your word, into the book of Titus together, God, that you would reveal to us the things that you would have for us to know. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. study in Titus. This is now our second week looking at the book. Last week, Ross gave us an introduction, letting us know um, some more background information about this book. Um, if you remember that uh, this book was written by Paul the Apostle, and he's writing to one of his co-workers, a guy named Timothy, who, as we're going to see this week, was left on the island of Crete to continue the ministry uh, that they were doing there. And so Titus was a disciple of Paul. And Paul is going to tell us right here, beginning in verse 5 of Titus 1, that Paul has a plan, right? He says it this way, verse 5, This is why I left you in Crete. Paul is uh, letting Tim or Titus know that I have a purpose for why I left you there. And as we're going to see today, Paul's actually going to give uh, Titus three purposes uh, or things that he was to put in order there on Crete. And those three are this, the church the leadership of the church, and the truth of the scripture. Now, when we hear those words today, right, words like church, pastor, the Bible, they can bring many things to people's minds. Some of us, when we hear those words, we have great memories. Uh, we, in fact, we have blessings of growing up in a church community, and those words have taken on important, special meaning in our lives. But for some of us, unfortunately, we've not grown up in those environments. And so where we hear those words, there's a pain or a hurt that's associated with those words. And so this morning, even before we begin looking at what Paul was going to say to Titus, I would just encourage you to take a minute and to think about what those words mean for you. Maybe you just want to pause the video for just a second and to think about those words, the church, pastors or leadership in the church and the Bible. What connotations, what meanings have those words taken on to you? Or as our uh, challenge was from last week, what 
sources are influencing our versions of the truth or what sources are in, uh, influencing how we understand these words. Because Paul is going to tell Titus that he needs to uh, work on these things. And maybe for some of us today, the challenge is that we need to rethink our foundations as it applies to the church, the leadership, and the Bible. We're in this series on Titus that we've called Truth That Transforms. Truth That Transforms. And the whole idea behind this is that when we get the truth of God right, it should transform the way that we live. Uh, our key passage for this series comes out of Titus chapter 3, verse 8, where Paul says this. This is a trustworthy saying. I love that he highlights that. He's like, hey, this is something you need to lean into. And I want, I want you to insist insist on these things so that those who have believed in God, those who have good theology, those who understand the truth of who God is may be careful. Why? Not just to have head knowledge of the truth, but to devote themselves to good works. You see, the purpose of good theology should be good works or good practices that our living should be influenced by the things we know about God. He says these things are excellent and profitable for people. Those are things that we should be focusing our attention on. Russ also introduced us to an illustration last week where he said that Jesus, for many of us, it's like a pie chart, right? And Jesus is just one of the pieces of the pie chart, right? And so, like, maybe I just have a section in my day where I've kind of given to Jesus, right? Like, like, maybe he gets, like, 10 minutes in the morning, or maybe Jesus gets, you know, one day of the week or sometime one day of the week, like Sundays or other times, right? But that's really not a great picture of how we should look at Jesus. As we look at the truth of Jesus that transforms us, right, we should come to understand Jesus more as the hub in a wheel. You see, the hub is the thing that all the spokes are connected to. And we should see that as Jesus. If Jesus is our center point, then everything that we do in our lives and in our days should ultimately come from him. You see, that is the truth that transforms. And we're going to see that today. Now, as we look at this passage, it's important for us to note two things. First, Paul is giving instructions at a specific time to a specific person for a specific group of people. And so Paul is giving instructions to one of his disciples named Titus. And it's for a church community there in Crete of, uh, of, of Jesus followers. Okay? And so there's some specific things that Paul is going to say that Titus needs to do in that context. However, there is application. This is secondly, there is application, right, that is for us today for the church today. And that's what we're going to look at. So as we look at Paul's instructions, we're going to first look at his uh, initial instructions to Titus, and then we're going to look at the application for us today. So if you will, let's begin. Let's jump back in. Um, I already read part of verse 5, but let me read it all together again. Uh, Titus 1 verse 5 says this, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remains in order and appoint elders in every town as I have directed you. From what Paul is saying right here to Titus, that Paul left before he could, could, could ultimately finish building the church. That's, the, that's kind of our first point today, is that the church needed to be built, right? And so he's leaving Titus with these instructions. You need to build the church. You need to build the church. Uh, and, and it's interesting the words that he uses. He says that you must put in order. It's interesting the word that Paul uses here in the Greek. It's epi de ortho, right? And it's a combination of two Greek words. It's epi, which means um, upon, and then dia is really just to intensify. And then the word orthos, which means to straighten. Straighten. In English, this is where we get the word orthodontist, one who sets straight teeth, right? Or also the word where we get uh, orthopedist, one who sets straight teeth broken bones. And so what Paul is implying here is that there's something that needs to be put in order, that needs to be set straight, and that thing is the church. And Paul's going to go on from here to give uh, Titus instructions how to set the church uh, 
in order, but it's important that we notice that Paul's instructions here are to remind Titus that he needs to set these things in order. And as, uh, as Paul instructs him to set these in order, we need to notice that he does not say start over or come up with another plan. You see, today in our context, I think that is a common thought that a lot of people have. Hey, the church is really messed up. And so it's so messed up to the point that we just need to abandon this idea of church. And we can just kind of follow Jesus on our own. Yet we find that nowhere in the pages, pages of Scripture. In fact, Jesus himself says in Matthew 16, 18, he says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Jesus himself thought the church was the way in which he was going to reach the world. You see, the church is God's plan A for reaching the world and there is no plan B. There is no plan B. And I think that's the way that Scripture describes that. In Ephesians 5, Paul will talk about the church as the bride of Christ. And you don't just abandon your bride one day because maybe you don't find her as attractive as you once did or she says things that uh, upset you or bother you. No, you, you work on that relationship. You set it straight. And this is the instructions that Paul is giving here to Titus. It's instructions that we need to look at in our lives as well. So a few questions. Does the church have its faults? We must say the answer is yes. Has the church made mistakes? Yes. Has the church looked un, very unlike Christ in its approach to things? Yes. Is there another or better way that God has determined for us to follow Christ? And the answer emphatically is no. Is no. And so what should we do, right, when the church has hurt? embarrassed or brought pain to people. Well, Paul's uh, words here to set straight, right? This idea to, to, to put what remains in order reminds me of some words that Jesus uses in Matthew chapter 5. In, in Matthew chapter 5, in a very famous sermon, right? Jesus, several times in that passage, will say something like, you have heard it said, but I say to you, right? Jesus never says, do away with what you've heard, Jesus just brings clarity to the things that they had heard in the law and in the prophets, right? And in the same way for us, we must re-look at, re-examine, refocus in on the church. We don't do away with the church, but we must take another approach to it. So our application is that we must rebuild the church, right? We need to rebuild the church. We need to own our junk, if you will. We need to take ownership of the things that the church has done historically wrong. That's the very first step for us, right? We can't hide behind it. We can't ignore it. We can't pretend like the church has always got it right because it hasn't. We got to own it. We got to own the mistakes. That's the very first step for us. So here's a few things that we need to own in the church. The church needs to be inclusive, not exclusive. You see, the church has this history of kind of welcoming those that are just like us, but not people who are different than us. And yet we see throughout scripture that Jesus had a very different model. In Galatians chapter 3 verse 28, Paul speaking of the church says this, that there is neither Greek nor Jew, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male and female, therefore you are all one in Christ, yet sometimes when we look around at our church communities, we all kind of look homogenous. We all look the same. And I think that's because we've been historically very exclusive and being, rather than being inclusive to mirror what our community looks like around us. Jesus speaking in the gospels in Matthew chapter five, verse 47 says it this way. He says, and if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same, right? Jesus is going to, on to talk about how we should live our lives. And he's like, oh, great. You, you greet those that look just like you and talk like you and act like you. What have you really accomplished? Jesus is challenging his followers that we need to step out of the bounds of what's comfortable and into the lives of the people that God has placed around us. And so our first, our churches need to not be, our churches need to be inclusive, not exclusive. Secondly, we need to realize that the church needs to be a friend, not a foe to people in our culture and in our community. We have cast out, we have set ourselves against certain groups in 
uh, in our world, in our community. This historically has looked like maybe single moms. Maybe this has looked like the LGBTQ community more recently. Uh, those that have been divorced. People on the political left or people on the political right. People who don't agree with some of our political views or stances. Right? We don't view them as a friend. We view them as an enemy, as a foe. And so there is a wall up between us and them. And you know what? Jesus actually did this. Jesus went and hung out with people that the culture, especially the religious culture, had cast out, who had set up as the enemy. And Jesus caught a lot of flack for it. In fact, in Matthew 11, verse 19, Jesus says this, The Son of Man came eating and drinking. And they said, Look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom justified by her deeds. You know what, church? If it was if Jesus was called a sinner and a friend of tax collectors, then I think I'm okay with my reputation getting tarnished a little bit by people if I'm trying to live in the same way that Jesus lived. Right? Let me ask you a question before you get upset, right? I'm not saying that we need to con conform to culture at all. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that our starting point <coughs> is to meet people where they are and then show them the truth that transforms. All right? Let me ask you a question. When God found you, where were you at? Because what Scripture tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, is that we were dead in our trespasses and sin. What that means is there was nothing that we could do. We were hopelessly, helplessly lost in our trespasses and sins. And yet, as we get down to verse 4, the beautiful news is, but God. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sin, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And so before we get so judgmental, before we get so against people in our culture, let's think about where we were when God found us and God's approach to us. God was rich in mercy. And so should we, the church needs to be a friend, not a foe. Third, the church needs to be repentant, not judgmental. Repentant, not judgmental. It reminds me of this parable that Jesus shares. This is in uh, Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14, right? And he was saying this parable to uh, a group of, of people to demonstrate something. And he said there were two, two men that were in the temple one day. Uh, one was a tax collector. One was a Pharisee. And as the Pharisee stood and prayed, he said this, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extorters and unjust adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. From the outside, this guy looked like he had it all, didn't he? Even so much so that he felt comfortable judging this tax collector. And yet the tax collector says this, but the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. But he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Here's Jesus' commentary on that. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, made right before God rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Church, we, the church needs to be repentant before we are judgmental. And let me just tell you, this process of owning our junk, it, it's painful. It is. It's uncomfortable. It's like that analogy of an orthodontist. If you've ever had braces, you know that when you go in every month to get your braces tightened, it's uncomfortable, right? But this process is that you're going to have a beautiful smile when everything is done. And our hope is that when we have gone through this painful process, that the church will be beautiful in the way that God intended her to be. Because this is the right thing to do. And if you have been frustrated and disappointed or just plain done with church, let me just first all say that I'm sorry. If no one else has ever said that to you, I'm sorry for how the church has treated us. We have to own that. 
But I would also encourage you to hang in there. Let us try to show you what God's beautiful intention was for the church. We can't give up on God's good plan. That's why I had a heart to plant this church. Not because I wanted to give up on the idea of church, but that I wanted to see church done the way that God has called us to do church. And so we can't give up on it. We got to work hard to set what remains in order. And that's got to start in the community of followers of Jesus. And so we're going to take our first little break this morning and have a discussion time. I would encourage you, if, if you're watching this with somebody at your ho- house, I would encourage you to discuss this. If you're there just uh, watching this by yourself, I would encourage you just to think through these questions for a few minutes. Our first discussion question is this. What has been your church experience, both church hurt and the blessings that come from being connected to church? Because there's, there's both. I think we forget sometimes that there is blessings from being connected with church. At least I hope there is. Secondly, what steps do you need to take to move past the hurt? I'm not saying that we need to forget it. I'm saying what steps do we need to intentionally move past the hurt? And then how will you share the stories of church blessing? How can we share those to encourage people? Now, we also have a question this morning for our kids too. So if you're watching this with your kids, right, here's a question for them to think about. What do you like about church, kids? What are the parts of church that you do not like and that are hard for you, kids? And then finally, why do you think church is important, kids? Why is that important, right? So take a few minutes, press pause on this video, um, discuss that, and we're going to come back and and look at a few more verses in Titus. Well, welcome back. We are going to jump back in, uh, starting in verse 6. Paul, again, is uh, explaining how Titus can... Uh, can form the church, can uh, what he needs to do to set these things in order, okay? And so um, this, the second uh, point that Paul's going to make to Titus is that the leadership needs forming. The leadership needs forming. Here's what he says in Titus chapter 6. I'm actually going to uh, pick up the very end of verse 5. He says, Appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and are not open to the charge of debauchery and insubordination. For an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold fast to the trustworthy word as taught by God so that he is able to give instruction and sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. All right, so the second thing is that that Paul is telling Titus, we need to form some leadership. The leadership needs forming here in these churches. And so what does he tell him to do? He says, go and appoint elders, elders. It reminds me of a quote by John Maxwell, who said, everything rises and falls on leadership. And so if Paul is wanting to, to, to reset the church or to form the church, build the church as it is, the first thing that he's telling Titus that he needs to do is to get some leaders in the church, because ultimately That's going to determine the pace and the heartbeat of this local church. So what is an elder? We would qualify an elder as a mature and qualified leader of the local church. A mature, uh, Timothy, in in Paul's instructions to Timothy, tells us that he should not be a new convert. It's someone who, who must at least to a point have an understanding of Scripture, okay? But also that there's some qualifications, You see, it's interesting. Paul had an intentional plan for how the church was to be led. It was not intended to be ran by the person with the loudest voice or the most intimidating personality. Unfortunately, that has been the way that a lot of our churches has been ran. No, for Paul, the church was to be led by a spiritually mature and biblically qualified man. And that's why he lays out these qualifications. Now, quick little clarification. The word elder or overseers we see in this passage sometimes uh, are used interchangeably, okay? And, um, and this was to include also words like pastor or shepherd. And so the word elder is the office in which, um, in which we hold as leaders in the church, right? And so whenever you hear the word elder, it's really kind of synonymous with pastor, okay? Um, But but elder more refers to the the title of the office where pastor or shepherd or overseer more talks about the duties, the things that an elder does, just to make a a little bit of a clarification as to what that uh, what that means. And so Paul here gives no gives some I'm sorry, he gives some specific qualifications for these leaders because it's an important task. Right. 
And um, in the the uh, NLT uh, or the I'm sorry the Life Application uh, Bible Commentary, they they say this um, about these qualifications. They say notice that most of the qualifications involve character, not knowledge or skill. A person's lifestyle and relationship provide a window into his character, his or her character. Consider these qualifications as you evaluate people for position of leadership in your church. It's important to have leaders who can effectively preach God's word, but even more importantly, that they must be living out God's word as examples for you to follow. You see, uh, in Crete, Paul knew there wasn't probably a whole lot of people who had been following Jesus for a long time. So it was crucial that they get these characteristics right. And the first one that he talks about, that he mentions there, he says, if anyone is above reproach. Now, this this, uh, word above reproach can also be blameless, right? Now, it doesn't mean perfect because we're all broken human beings, right? But it means it's an all-encompassing quality of an elder, Right? In this debased culture, they knew that an elder could not have any skeletons in the closet, if it were. Right? There must be beyond, this person must be beyond uh, the ability to, uh, to question their judgment, right? Um, especially as it relates to those outside of the church. And so there were these qualifications. They must be above reproach. This is why we have a season of testing and examination for our elders. If you guys remember back several months ago when we raised Ross and Sam up, we had a time of examination um, of their lives, um, not just myself, but some of our guiding elders. But then we also had a season that if anyone in the church had something that they were concerned about, that they could bring it before us as elders, right? Why? Because the, the, the men that are leading the church must be, first of all, above reproach. But then Paul goes on to give some more lists, and it's interesting that these kind of fall into two categories. The first uh, has to do with their marriage and family, Right? Why is this? Because a leader of the church of God uh, must lead their own house well before they can lead God's house. Now, it's interesting here that Paul uses uh, masculine pronouns to describe this person. Right? I think the reason for that is that uh, the elder's role in the church is to mirror that of a husband's role in a family. Where a husband is called to lead a family, a ch- an elder is called to lead the church. A husband is to steward his own house well. An elder is to steward the house of God well, which is why one of the qualifications is that if an elder can't steward or manage his own house well, then he's not qualified to manage God's household. But yet, after this, in verses 7 through 8, you see that there are characteristic traits, right? Because they are going to be representatives to those outside of the church. And Paul gives two of those. First of all, in verse 7, he gives those negative things that would disqualify someone from being an elder. Listen to what he says. For an overseer, or as a steward of God, uh, must be above reproach. As, um, as, a, as a steward, he must be above reproach. Sorry. Um, he must not be, listen, arrogant, or quick-tempered, or a drunkard, or violent, or greedy for, for gain, right? These are all things that will disqualify us. And unfortunately, we've seen these in our culture. Even recently, we've seen these in the, in the carnage that it will cause within a church body. But then secondly, he goes on in verse 8 to give a positive list or qualifications that also must be true. So it's not enough not to do these horrific things, but there's some other qualities that also must be part of the elder's life. He must be hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Do you notice what these characteristics point to? They point to Jesus, don't they? right? The elder should look like a human, broken and imperfect, right? Representation of Jesus. It goes back to what we said earlier when we began this morning, that Jesus is the center. And Jesus should be the center of the church, but Jesus should also be the center of the life of the leaders in the church. And the leaders should look like Jesus. Another interesting thing to note is that these qualifications should also be true for all of us that follow Jesus, not just the leadership, but the leadership should be an example to the body in all of these things. So what is our application? Our application is that we must reform, okay? So if, if, if Titus had to form the leadership, we must reform the leadership in the church around the person of Jesus, right? 
We, we must make sure that our leaders in the church, our elders in the church, look like Jesus. I know some of you have had really bad examples of leaders in the church, and especially over the last few years, we've seen things like immorality and lies and pride just wreck churches, right? But that was never God's intention. You see, this was God's plan So we must, right? The leadership in the church was God's plan, so we must reform the purpose of leadership. How do we do that? Well, we need to be held accountable, right? As members of this church, if you are a member of Bedrock Church, you have a voice. And if you see some of these qualities in one of us as a leader, you have a place to bring that up to us. Not judgmental, right? But in a loving way to bring that to our attention so it's something that we can work on in our, in our lives so we can be a great example. And David Brooks said it well when he said, the church needs saints, not celebrities, right? So why, right? And why, why is it important, right? Notice here that Titus, um, when he's getting these instructions about setting up um, leadership, it says that for him to appoint elders in every town, as I directed you, notice that elders is plural. And that's why we believe that there should be a plurality of leadership. It's not a one-man show. Right? And there's a few reasons for that. One, the biblical example, whenever you see the word elder used, it's specifically used in the local church. It's talking about more than one, a plurality. We think that's intentional because it also brings accountability to make sure we live the way that God has called us to. And so the three of us elders locally here in Bedrock, we have that accountability where we're checking in with each other, but we also have guiding elders that are outside of our body that looks in in the decisions that we make to make sure that we're stewarding God's church well. And then also it brings more gifts to the body, and aren't we grateful that we get all of those gifts in the body? And so we must reform the leadership in the church. But then finally, finally, Paul's instructing Titus that the truth of the scripture needed to be claimed. The truth needed to be claimed. Look at verse 9. He says, for, for he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine, right? The truth that transforms, and also to re- rebuke those who contradict it. Our culture has defined truth in many ways, but followers of Jesus find the source of truth in Scripture. In fact, uh, Ross mentioned this a few weeks ago, um, but in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 and 4, Paul warns Timothy, another one of his disciples, about uh, the world's desire to, to, to hear things that they uh, like, things that are easy for them to hear. Here's how he says it, starting in verse 3. He says, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, not the passions of God, but their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. You see, for the leaders of the church, and this implies for all of us in the church, right, the source of truth is the scripture, and we must get back to this. During the days of the Reformation in the 1500s, there was a phrase, there was a a rally cry around this idea of returning to the truth of the scriptures, And a German monk, a guy named Martin Luther, um, came up with this phrase, sola scriptura. Sola scriptura means scripture alone, right? As the rally cry. And here's what it means. John MacArthur picks up on this. He says this. He said, simply, this simply means that all truth necessary for our salvation and spiritual life is taught either explicitly or implicitly in scripture. It is not a claim that all truth of every kind is found in scripture. Martin Luther himself said it this way. He says, the truth of scripture comes first. After that is accepted, one may determine whether the words of men can be accepted as true. Scripture becomes the lens through which we see what is true and what is not true. MacArthur goes on to say it this way. He says, scripture is therefore the perfect and only standard of spiritual truth, revealing infallibly all that must be believed in order to be saved and all that we must do in order to glorify God. Paul is encouraging Titus that the leadership and thus implied the church needed to get back, needed to form their foundational truth around the word of God, around the scripture, around the word of God. 
And so what does that mean for us today? Well, our application today is that we must reclaim the truth. We must reclaim the truth. You see, there is a, uh, there is a, a, uh, an idea out here that either truth is relative or you, there's many places that you can find your, your source of truth, right? The Bible may be one of those, but what scripture claims and what we've seen throughout church history to claim for those who have followed Jesus is that the source of truth that rises above the rest is scripture. It must be the place that we go to, to find truth that will transform our lives. Notice also though that Paul gives a final instruction here to the elders, but I think it's also implied to all of us that are following Jesus, that if there are false doctrines, that we must rebuke them. The leadership must be the first to rebuke false teaching, but not the only ones. You see, we are all commanded to rebuke false teaching as we hear it. A.W. Tozer put it this way. He said, increasing numbers of evangelical Christians are becoming ashamed to be found unequivocally on the side of truth. But moral power has always accompanied definitive belief. We need right now a return to a gentle dogmatism that smiles while it stands stubborn and firm to the word of God that liveth and abideth forever. Man, we don't talk like that today, but I wish we did, right? We need a gentle dogmatism, right? We need to, to stand firm, gently, yes, as we approach people, lovingly, yes, as a friend to people, but we're not moving. We're stubborn. We are staying on the Word of God, and we're not going to be moved no matter what culture or those around us or other people that we, that we know say to us. We must stand on the truth of, of Scripture. You see, there are many churches today that have gone far away from Scripture and look nothing like what this book teaches us for how we should live our lives. So we, I want you to think about this for just a few minutes. Uh, again, maybe a good opportunity to press pause and to think about this. But what is the general perspective right, of the Bible from your subculture? So what I mean by culture is we all live in culture, right? Right? But each one of us has a subculture, another culture within culture, the people that you hang out with, the voices that you listen to, the group of people that you spend your time with, right? What is their perspective on the Bible? How do you feel about this perspective? Is it right? Is it wrong? Right? What's, what's your opinion? What's your thought on it? And what do you find to be the hardest part of aligning your life with the Bible? So take some time and, and talk about that. Kids, here's your question today. It's what is the Bible? Where did it come from? And why should we follow what it says? When we come back, we're going to wrap up with our challenge for this week. Well, guys, hopefully you have been encouraged today um, by Paul's instructions to Titus and, and really instructions for us today. Um, and what that looks like for us today is a call to rebuild, right? To rebuild the church, to, 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 to look at leadership, right? Um, the leadership in the church. We must reform the leadership in the church back to the image of Jesus. And we must reclaim the truth of God's word in our lives. And so I would ask us this week, how are we doing that? And where are we getting our source of truth from? A little bit of follow-up, right? So here's the challenge this week, right? There's an article uh, that I'm encouraging all of us to read this week. It's called, Is the Bible Reliable? Um, and you can find it on gotquestions.org, or we will text it out. If you uh, get our group text, we'll text out that link tomorrow. Um, and so you can read it there, or you can just go to gotquestions.org, right? And here, here's what I want you to do. After you've read that, I want you to think through the reasons we have to trust the Bible as both historical and accurate. And ask yourself these questions. How should believing the Bible is truth change my day-to-day -day experience? How should it change my relationships? How should it change the way I spend my time? How should it change the way I see the world? One resource um, to encourage you with today um, is a book by uh, Timothy Keller called The Reason for God. And he just dives in a little bit deeper into how can we believe what Scripture has to say and, and trust God and Jesus and things like that. So great resource if you want to dive in a little bit deeper. Church, I just want to encourage you this week, right, to not give up on the church, not give up on the leadership of the church, and definitely don't give up on, uh, on Scripture, right? Because, because this is God's plan. And we must hold fast to it. Church, you are sent this week to bring rescue and restoration 
to Franklin County by the gospel of Jesus. We love you. Bye-bye.